This is CBC Here and Now. A sure sign of an upcoming federal election. There's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. He's on the campaign trail in St. John's tonight, and he's speaking live at a liberal fundraiser at Memorial University's Signal Hill campus. Here now is Katie Breen. We'll have all the details of what he's having to say coming up. Well, it's a question many people in town are asking themselves, will it go ahead or won't it go ahead? Well, regardless of what happens, it's the day before regatta. I'm down at the lake, and I've got lots of stories coming up on Here and Now. And judging by that picture, you can see the weather's quite nice right now down by the lake. But is it going to continue? Like Jeremy said, uh, you're probably playing regatta roulette tonight. Red light, yellow light, green light. I'll let you know when we come back. Thanks, Ashley. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Peter Cowan. Tonight, the mother of a disabled teen is speaking out about illegal parking and careless driving. Lisa Power Mackey has a modified van that allows her son Benjamin to get around in his wheelchair. But on a recent trip to Costco, Benjamin's access was blocked. Here now's Mark Quinn has more. At the best of times, it's a lot of work for super mom Lisa Power Mackey to get her son Benjamin in and out of their van. And as you can see here, it's important that the space beside the Blue Zone parking spot is clear. Yesterday, things didn't go so smoothly. This pickup parked in the clearly marked no parking zone meant Benjamin couldn't get out of the drizzly weather and into his family's van. It's a big safety issue because if I was there myself, I would have to leave him on the side to back him out. Um, if the driver of the van happened to be in the wheelchair, they wouldn't be able to back it out. They wouldn't be able to get into their vehicle. So it's more than just a convenience for us to park there. It is a safety issue. Nearby workers made sure Power Mackey could back out and get her son safely into their van. And later, she sent these photos to the police. Illegal parking like this can result in a fine of more than $400. The RNC says it isn't pursuing this case because it hasn't received a formal complaint. But its spokesperson agreed parking like this is clearly not acceptable. Power Mackey says she briefly spoke with the driver. He came running out of the store with his armload of groceries and said he didn't know he couldn't park there and he jumped in his truck and drove away. Never once offered an apology or anything. But for her part, Power Mackey isn't looking for someone to punish. I don't even care who this actual person was. I mean, I saw him. I could have took his picture, but I didn't. And it's more just to educate people that the spots are there for a reason. I mean, you can park... 30 seconds away and walk. If, if Benjamin could walk, I would absolutely love it. But I mean, he can't, so we need to park in those spots in order for him to get out of the vehicle. Those photographs that Power Mackey posted on Facebook have been shared thousands of times, and hundreds of people have commented on them. Shockingly, some of them have suggested that Power Mackey is a bad mother. She's trying to ignore those comments and hopes that all this publicity will mean that some people will think twice about their bad parking. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. A former provincial fisheries minister has died. Jim Morgan died Sunday in St. John's. He was 79 years old. Hey, thanks very much. Going off to the house. Morgan represented Bonavista South for 17 years. Beginning in 1972, he held several government portfolios and was the minister of fisheries until he was accused of illegally fishing salmon. Morgan was acquitted on the charge, but was never able to rebuild his political career. A funeral will be held Friday at St. Thomas Anglican Church in St. John's. Police in Stephenville are looking for a man who allegedly tried to lure a woman into his vehicle. The RCMP say a woman was approached by a man who was driving a blue sedan last week. The woman didn't know the driver and refused to get in the car. The driver is described as bald and in his 40s, and the vehicle had stickers on the front windshield. Anyone with information is asked to contact the police or Crime Stoppers. Government officials were in Whitless Bay today to meet with town council about a controversial construction project. According to the Department of Municipal Affairs and Environment, the town does not have the permits to create an erosion wall on Ragged Beach. Construction started last week, but a group of local residents protested to have it stopped citing environmental concerns as well as fears of further development. When CBC News asked the town if it had the required permits, officials told our reporter to file an access to information request. 
Government officials now say they're working with the town to make sure it's aware of the rules. Once an application has been submitted by the town, the province will review it. Something we both really enjoy with our buddies and it's kind of like a pastime in the summer but we're also staying in shape. So it's, it's, a, great, it's a great activity for, for summer, like stay in shape for ice hockey, so we love doing it. It's a lot of fun. The National Ball Hockey Championships are in town and six teams from this province are vying for a title. We'll have that story coming up on Here and Now. The Muskrat Falls Reservoir will start to fill this evening. Nalcor says water will naturally start increasing today and it will continue to rise right up until the end of September. Now some people are marking the milestone in Happy Valley Goose Bay and that's where Here Now's Jacob Barker is live tonight. Jacob, what are they doing? Well, Peter, actually what I'm holding here is a plate of salmon and not just any salmon, locally caught salmon. And the fear is that food like this, uh, salmon, uh, other fish, um, seal, things like that, after the impoundment of, of Muskrat Falls, uh, food like this, uh, it, at least in large quantities, uh, will become more difficult and, and more dangerous to eat. Um, this is one of the major fears that, that has been ongoing, uh, is, is the effect that it will have on traditional food sources. Um, and the... This is what prompted those protests in October of 2016. Uh, that same year, the Nunatsiavut government released a study that, which suggested that flooding the reservoir could render country food unsafe to eat. And tonight, they're symbolically marking that event. Uh, people are here are holding what they're calling a traditional last meal. I spoke with Roberta Benefiel, who was busy in the kitchen as she prepared for the feast. A meal, because this is going to be traditional food. I mean, uh, I've got some uh, uh, fish and brews, uh, codfish over here, and we've got salmon coming and a duck and, you know, things that people will miss if, if the methylmercury rises in the food chain. So that's why we wanted to do it with traditional food and just, just to make a statement and, and to show that we're, we're here and we're with Rigolette on this and we're with no Nazi but on this and um, to show the government and Nalcor that you know what they're doing is wrong. Now the government missed a deadline for mitigation work which would have reduced uh, the methylmercury levels. Uh, it instead offered each of the indigenous groups $10 million. Nunatuvut and the inundation took the payout. Nunatsiavut didn't. Meanwhile, Nal Nalcor's research has suggested methylmercury levels will only rise slightly and will have no impact on human health. Nalcor tells me they've done science and the government is, is parroting what Nalcor tells them. Unless we see an independent scientist come in here and show us that science and show us exactly why they're right and Harvard is wrong, then as far as we're concerned, this is poisoning the food chain and poisoning people and always will be. Now, along with that announcement that levels will begin rising uh, naturally this evening in the reservoir, uh, it is also warning people that impoundment will create safety concerns around the reservoir and that people should avoid uh, the area between Muskrat Falls and Gull, Gull Island as it's taking place. Reporting live for Here and Now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. Thank you, Jacob. Still in Labrador, motorcycle riders are spreading a message of hope with a long-distance ride. They call it Moving Forward. It's a journey from Happy Valley Goose Bay to Labrador City and back again, more than 1,000 kilometers in total. The 15 or so riders want to let people who are struggling with mental illness know they're not alone. I was a, a friend of mine, Lauren Winters. He was, he was living over in Labrador City and just having a, a tough time of things and on August 6th it got to be too much for him and, and he, he took his own life. At the time he sent me a message and told me to hang in there and I thought no more of it than you know he knew what I was going through and he was talking to me like not realizing that he was in such a bad place himself and he took his life right afterwards. So I mean that inspire me to carry on and, and try and, you know, like you said, hang in there, buddy, you know. I decided I should do something and a couple months later just come to me about doing a motorcycle ride for, for mental health awareness. 
when we get out on motorcycles for the most of us it's therapeutic it's you know you're just you and the road and the bike and you know it kind of clears your mind and and gets and i think and a lot of people feel that way about it and for me it's always been like if i need a break if i need to get away from things i'll hop on the bike and blast up the highway for a bit and you know like kind of clear my head people can't do enough to get out there the message that i mean it's not uncommon to to suffer with like an ailment that you can't help you can't do nothing about i mean i know how it feels to be like feel hopeless and feel all energy is drained from you and this you know you don't have the energy to carry on and and to have to soldier through it you know i mean especially after losing several friends now to this right i mean our the main co-founder of with with me in this was uh, was max bubba matthews and and last year he took his life just before the ride so after that i'll, I'll never stop as long as i'm able to do this i will well, to another road race, this one that's not going ahead this year, Targa Newfoundland's annual race will not happen. That's according to the group's president. The race is being rescheduled for next year, September 2020. According to a Facebook post, the decision was made after a dozen of this year's entries canceled. With little hope of replacing them, the call was made to cancel. The head of Targa says it was a difficult decision, but the right one. Next month's race would have been the 18th running of the Targa race. It covers more than 1,500 kilometers across central and eastern Newfoundland. Targa says the remaining racers who paid to participate this year will have their entries pushed ahead to 2020. While staying with sports, the regatta isn't the only major event on the Avalon this week. The ball hockey national championships are happening in Mount Pearl. Here now is Ryan Cook reports. The National Ball Hockey Championships are drawing crowds in Mount Pearl and the Goulds this week as six teams from this province vie for national championships. And for any Newfoundland Growlers fans, there's a couple faces you might recognize. This is our, what, fourth or fifth tournament? And the, I feel like it gets better every year. Um, a lot of good ice hockey players play in this tournament too, so uh, it's just something we like to do in the summer. It's good cardio. All our buddies play, so uh, we look forward to this every summer. O'Brien and Power are having the best year of their hockey careers coming off a Kelly Cup win with the Growlers. After winning an ECHL championship for their hometown team, they want to add a national ball hockey title. It's pretty special to get two championships in one year, so that's what we're gunning for and uh, hopefully we can pull that off here this weekend. There are three divisions in the tournament, men's, women's and masters. Newfoundland and Labrador has two entries for each division. Many of the women are coming into the tournament fresh off a win at the World Championships. Tournament organizers are hoping to draw a big crowd here this week. One person that will be watching closely is Terry Ryan Sr., whose son is playing in the men's and the master's divisions. Sr. knows a thing or two about sports. He says this is just as good as watching ice hockey. To me, it's harder to play because there's no gliding. It's stop and go. It must be really hard on the joints, but... Uh, you know, it's a speed, the ball, the speed of the game, and that's what I love about it. The round robin runs throughout this week, and the finals go this weekend. Ryan Cook, CBC News, Mount Pearl. All eyes are on the forecast for tomorrow. A gorgeous evening down by the lake right now. I'll tell you what the forecast has in store, and we'll look ahead a couple of days when I come back.
Welcome back to Here Now. And before we get to that regatta forecast, because I know everyone wants to see it, there's a few photos that we want to show you. Yeah, it's been great weather for photography, even in Labrador, especially for whales. Take a look at these pictures. Eldred Allen took these and just off the wharf in Rigolette, this is a minke whale that's been hanging out feeding near the wharf in Rigolette. And by the way, in Rigolette, a minke whale is also called a grumpus. Mm. So check out that little grumpus there frolicking and uh, everyone in Rigolette's been enjoying the view there as he goes around and scoops up some of those fish. That's look at that guy's expression on the wharf there. That's, that's incredible. I didn't know what they look like. I didn't realize that they had that on their underside there. Well, that's when it's all filled up with oh. fresh fish and scooped full of water and all that stuff. So, uh, well, then there you go. Wow, great shots, beautiful shots. <laughs> and will it be as beautiful for the regatta tomorrow? Come on, you've been holding us in suspense. You refused to, like, there are people who have evening plans. They're counting on you. Come on, Ashley. You're going to have to wait just a couple more minutes. Uh, yeah, temperatures today, we talked about how uh, they weren't really going to move much uh, yesterday. We'll take a look at the temperatures that we hit today. 18 degrees here in St. John's. It was a beautiful afternoon for the most part. 18 in Badger as well. 21 for Corner Brook, and then we've got those temperatures in the teens through Labrador. Currently just a couple of degrees cooler still. 16 degrees in St. John's. We do have a couple of showers on the go down through the southern half of the Avalon. As we head through the night tonight, things should clear out for the most part. Slight chance of some showers up through Labrador and then for Central as well. Be very spotty if it happens at all. Probably just a few spits of rain. Otherwise, we do have some showers moving in for Labrador and they're going to be pretty heavy as we head through the night tonight and that will head towards Central as we get into those early morning hours. Otherwise, some cloud cover is going to move in for the island, but overnight beautiful temperatures anywhere from 10 to 12 degrees. Port of Aska a little warmer at 16 tonight. Still again have that slight chance of some showers. Otherwise we should see uh, just partly to mostly cloudy skies. Light winds continuing and this is teeing us up to the forecast for tomorrow as well. Looks pretty nice actually. South southeasterlies up through Lab City, uh, 14 degrees. That chance of showers and heavier showers moving in towards the early morning hours. Otherwise, just some coastal showers still continuing. It does look like it should just sit around 10 degrees for Cartwright, seven for Nain. So if you're playing regatta roulette tonight, it does look like you have the green light. The forecast does look good for tomorrow. Uh, just some cloudy periods for the most part. Now, some of the models are pointing at the chance of some showers in the afternoon. If they do develop, again, likely just a few spits of showers. And then along the west coast as well, up through Labrador, very unsettled though. We are looking at uh, potentially even a few rumbles of thunder near Churchill Falls. Otherwise, we'll see some periods of rain move through, head towards the coast as we head into the evening hours. And there's uh, that potential for showers as well for the Bayvert Peninsula and then overnight some more cloudy periods moving in. Overall, those winds looking generally light for tomorrow. Variable 10 to 15 kilometers per hour if you are uh, heading off to the lake. 19 degrees should peak, and then if a sea breeze kicks in, we could see temperatures a little bit cooler, but generally uh, just looking at those cloudy periods. So. As it's my first regatta, it looks like uh, it should be a good one. Uh, as far as everywhere else, it looks like we're going to see temperatures in the teens. Placentia, 19 degrees. Marystown, a little warmer. We are starting to see that heat move in. Certainly by the time the weekend rolls around, we'll see some warmer temperatures. Clarenville uh, and Bonavista both sitting between uh, 15 and 21 degrees. Cooler near the shore. 24 for Grand Falls, Windsor, Harbor, Breton sitting at 20. But again, should see some peaks of sun with those cloudy periods into the afternoon. Not a whole lot happening. And then the chance of some scattered showers as well. 25 for Stephenville, Cornerbrook 25, same for Gross Morn. And then up through uh, St. Anthony, 18 degrees. Port, uh, Port Schwa, 21. And then up through Labrador, 19 degrees for Cartwright. Mary's Harbor sitting at 15 degrees as well. So the temperatures are starting to climb a little bit. And then uh, as those periods of rain move through Lab City, there is that potential for some uh, a few rumbles of thunder for Churchill Falls. Nain still hanging on to those cooler temperatures. Double digits, though, uh, 10 degrees, 16 in Makovic, and those winds uh, generally from the east between 20 to 30 kilometers per hour. So I mentioned that uh, we're going to start to see some warmer temperatures as we head towards the weekend. But with that, it does look like we've got some rain on the way as well. I'll have all those details coming up. Well, as Mayor Danny Breen said today, uh, today is like 
Christmas Eve for townies. It's the eve before regatta, and as you can see, there's lots of people taking in the sights and the sounds and taking some samples of food. We're down at the lake, and there's a little bit of rolling going on, I hear, and we're going to have a story about that coming up after the break. Welcome back to Here and Now. As we showed you right at the top of today's show, the Prime Minister has touched down in the province. Justin Trudeau is in town to speak at a Liberal fundraiser in St. John's and, of course, go to the regatta. Now, Here and Now's Katie Breen is standing by at Memorial University's Signal Hill campus. So, Katie, the Prime Minister just wrapped up speaking. What exactly did he have to say? You know, I'm going to get to that speech, but first I want to talk to you about not only the people inside that room, but the people outside the, the building here on Signal Hill. 
the protesters, they were here today. There was a, a handful of them, and they wanted to make their issues with the Prime Minister known. They said they had issues with uh, land issues and, and water, things like pipelines and methylmercury. They say that the Prime Minister has broken promises to Indigenous people, and they wanted that known. Now, once you got inside, of course, the room a lot more friendly. This was a $300 plate dinner, which they're in having now. But before that, the Prime Minister came out. That means there's a lot of reasons to feel anxious. There's a lot of ways for politicians who want to, to highlight that anxiety, to amplify that anxiety and those concerns back to people. That's not what we've chosen to do, and that's not, we'll, that, not what we'll be doing in this upcoming election. Because one of the dirty little secrets of politics is that the politics of division, of negativity, of fear, it can work to get you elected. But once you get elected by scaring people, by exaggerating their fears and anxieties, it becomes very difficult to solve those problems. When people are busy hunkering down, when people are busy being divided against their neighbors or against the other part of the country, it becomes really hard to pull together and solve it. So you heard some things there about what he was saying in the speech, but there were definitely things that weren't in the speech. There were no goodies announced here today. The federal election, of course, is in 76 days from now, and sometimes at these sorts of things, leaders come out and, and make promises. None of that was said here today. It was mostly about fear-mongering and, and division, divisive politics. What, um, what also we didn't hear about was the Atlantic Accord. Now, back when that agreement was renegotiated and there was a, another signing of that document, Ottawa promised to mitigate some of the electricity rates once Muskrat Falls comes online. Now, we are expecting maybe some, some movement on that, and maybe today would be the time where he would announce that. But there was nothing about that talked about here tonight. Um, there are also no questions. We weren't allowed to ask questions about the speech, so we weren't able, able to bring that issue up. And the Premier, as you said, or sorry, the Prime Minister, as you said, will be at the regatta tomorrow, and there will be no questions there as well. Live in St. John's, I'm Katie Breen for here and now. Well, as you heard, the next stop for the Prime Minister is the regatta, but Jeremy Eaton has already beat him there because he's lakeside tonight where the vendors are busy setting up. And uh, how come you don't have any food in your hand, Jeremy? I figured you'd at least have some fries by now. No, I already had a hot dog and some fries. You know, I'm watching my figure. Um, but as you can tell, uh, I, I love the regatta. Uh, and the, one of the most interesting things about the regatta is that people often say that the stories are the same year after year. But earlier today, we were down for the unveiling of the new winner's circle, and I met a family of four generations of rowers, all inspired by a special piece of jewelry. So take a listen to this. This is my father's necklace. Uh, he it's, it's not exactly a necklace, but it's his uh, medal that he won in 1936. And it was, he considered the best year of his life because he put first, he married my mother, but he won the race, the mercantile amateur race. Uh, his name was John Farrell and he was born in 1908. And he rode from the time he was a young man he worked at Borrowing Brothers and he was a big strapping man and he loved the regatta and he loved this pond. And we grew up on New Cove Road, which is just up the road. And we would come down to the regatta. It was a, a family event. People used to come and stay and the whole day was just a, an event. Uh, it bypassed most of us. I have one daughter and uh, Connie took up rowing. So she wears this medal when she races. Picked up the sport of rowing. It was really important to my grandfather. Um, I lived you know, close by the, the lake here, so I felt it was really, really important that I pick it up as well. I had a group of friends when I was a late teenager that were interested in rowing. So I picked it up. That was 21 years ago. So this is my 21st year rowing. Um, really important for my grandfather and now really important for myself and also my two uh, children. My two girls are rowing now. I got involved because of my mother. Um, she, it, I've already done a bunch of different sports and this was another one that I thought I should try and I ended up liking it and I continued with the sport and this is my fourth year doing it. So how is your crew expected to do tomorrow? I understand that you have some high hopes for your race tomorrow. Yes, we are hoping to get the record. Our crew has been together for the full four years and uh, last year we placed fourth 
and that was fairly good since all the other crews were a year older than us. I think I picked up the sport of rowing from Ella a few years ago. And how many regattas have you rowed in? This year will be my first. And do you understand how important rowing is to your family? And how does it make you feel knowing that tomorrow will be your first regatta? Uh, I feel like it was very important and um, it's kind of nervous because it will be my first one. I think my grandfather would be so proud of us. Um, you know, the medal my grandmother, my mom found in his fishing tackle box, and it didn't really mean a whole lot to my grandfather until he pulled it back out, and it was, his mom cleaned it up and uh, shined it up, and my grandfather then told the story to uh, my mom about how important it was later on. So it's a pretty special medal for all of us and a special day for our, for our family. So if the regatta does go ahead tomorrow, I know Kathy Andrews will be one happy mom and grandma as she watches her daughter and two granddaughters row, especially Allison rowing in her first regatta. She's a little bit nervous and a lot excited, and hopefully the weather holds and that uh, the races will all go ahead tomorrow morning. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Jeremy Eaton at Kitty Vitty Lake in St. John's. Last year they definitely underestimated us, but this year I think uh, they know what we're all about and I think we have higher expectations than last year. That's Seth Hyde of Outer Cove and if he sounds like a pro, that's because rowing is in his blood at least six generations back. Seth's story is coming up ahead. Welcome back to Here and Now. Tracking online sexual predators and cracking down on how they share data and where they hide it is a complex and costly venture. Today, the federal government announced it's pumping an additional $22 million into the effort to protect children from sexual exploitation. And they hinted it may call on the technology industry itself to foot the bill in the future. If human harm is done, if a child is terrorized for the rest of their life, because of what happened to them on the internet. If there are other damages and costs, then maybe the platform that made that possible should bear the financial consequences. 
The minister says the issue is of global concern and that Canada is working with tech giants and its so-called Five Eyes intelligence partners on new strategies. He notes information sharing by child protection agencies and governments has already led to speedier detection and removal of suspected images online, but he concedes more needs to be done to clamp down. The funding announced today is intended in large part to go to municipal and provincial police to enhance their capability at detecting and identifying this sort of material. Acclaimed American author Toni Morrison has died, the author of 11 novels. She won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1993. She was later awarded the U.S. Presidential Medal of Freedom. Toni Morrison is one of our nation's most distinguished storytellers. Morrison was known for exploring the black experience in America. Two of her most celebrated works were Song of Solomon and Beloved. Morrison died of complications from pneumonia. She was 88. Well, there's something wild happening in a neighborhood in Whitehorse. Everything from boots to ball gloves is disappearing. And so far, the culprit has been too cunning to catch in the act. The CBC spoke to the woman who is trying to sort out the fur from the fluff. Okay, welcome to our Fox Depot here. Can find all kinds of treasures, beautiful treasures found by the foxes all over. So we got in here from working gloves found actually this morning to baseball gloves to high-end shoes to smaller shoes. So those foxes have been very busy around and getting them all of that stuff here. So the Fox Depot project actually has a stem from this um, neighborhood issue of having um, our little pups this year, which there are actually six foxes around that have been habituated to humans, unfortunately, and that are actually teething on anything that they, that's smelly and that they can find in the neighborhood. I was like, okay, this is too much. Let's do something. And I just kind of got going with the little project. The neighborhood really thought that like, we had a running gag really of saying that we're sure that they're starting a baseball team because in the space of uh, about one week, we had five, six baseball gloves disappearing. I find that they are definitely entitled and they should be because this is like, we're actually, we build those houses on their, wilder on their wilderness property, really. Some people have actually, it's really pretty cool to see, have been reunited with their missed belonging. <laughs> At the end of the day, if they, they are not reunited with what, with what they're looking for, or that they're not dropping something, or that it's just seeing the title and make them smile, well, then that's, that's altogether a better day. What a cute little story. Well, back in local news, a preteen from Outer Cove is gearing up for his second race at the Royal St. John's Regatta. But for Seth Hyde, rowing isn't just a sport, it's in his blood. That's because Seth is a sixth generation rower. At least, that's as far back as they can tell. And his Hall of Famer dad, Darren, is also the team's coxswain. No pressure. Here now is Darren Hyde and his son, Seth. My name is Darren Hyde and I'm the coxswain for the Madsen squad team. I also roll myself this year with a master's crew, which is uh, master's meaning we're a lot older. My name is Seth Hyde. I'm 11 years old and I row number two in the boat and I'm a part of the Madsen group squad team. In 1985, we were on an intermediate crew. It was our very first year rowing, very first time we set foot in the boat. And when we did that, my brother even got in the boat backwards. Like, we didn't know how to sit into it. We uh, broke the intermediate record that held for 16 years. Uh, that was a big honor. At the time, uh, we didn't think it was a big deal, but it, it was fun, and, and, and we enjoyed that. It was just like, almost like winning the championship for us to do that. How you doing, Brody? It's great that we still have the same team. You know, it shows that they're really committed to the sport. It's just an honor to be out on the pond every second day. Just to get in the regatta and make it up and down that pond is an accomplishment in itself. So everybody should be in the Hall of Fame, in my thought. Brody, Simon. My earliest memory of that was my uncle was rowing, and I remember at the end of the race, he was exhausted with his head down, and I wasn't used to seeing him like that, and I said, my goodness, how hard is this rowing if he's exhausted? Because he was in really good shape. 
my great great grandfather rowed, my great grandfather, my grandfather, my uncles, uh, myself, and now my son is rowing. It is in the Rose family. Well, I never knew it was um, that long back. My dad only told me about my great grandfather and that. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm happy to keep the trend going, and w uh, maybe when I get older, I'll get my kids into rowing too. Okay, guys, one, two, three, push. I'm glad that he had that interest because I knew that coming up, it kind of kept me out of trouble a little bit. Not that saying that I'd get in a lot of trouble, but it kept us focused, kept us uh, recognizing that hard work is necessary if you want to achieve something in life. And nothing come e comes easy. The crew, we had a, a great bunch of boys, right, guys, great bunch of boys, and as I said, great bunch of parents. We have a lot of hockey and soccer players on our team. The stroke is Simon Shanahan. He's really strong and powerful. And Andrew Percy's number five. He's really, he's strong, just like Simon, hockey player. Uh, Brody has powerful legs. Ethan Walsh, very strong too. Uh, me, I'm a hockey player. And Grant, he's a very great addition to the team. It was always hard. Rowing is very hard, but the rewards are, are great. Well, last year they definitely underestimated us, but this year I think they know what we're all about, and they know what we're going and they know what our expectations are. So I think that they don't doubt us as much this year, and I think we have higher expectations than last year. Let's go, guys. Good, that's good. Good rowing, guys. What are your expectations for this year? Um, top three, hopefully. Top three. Um, I'd be happy not to come in last, but, um, you know, it's just for fun, and um, it's just an honor to be a part of the regatta. leading into the regatta, and uh, what amazing little guy. Maybe we can get him to come and do the commentary for us tomorrow night on Here and Now. Jeremy, we'll be back. Lakeside, here and now continues in just a moment. Welcome back to Here Now, and Ashley, tomorrow, it's a very special day for you, isn't it? It is. 
It is your very first regatta. Yep, I'm pretty excited about it. Anything in particular, like what are you looking forward to most? Uh, I hear the food is really good, so I'm looking forward to that. And then just being outside by water and watching people do sports. <laughs> And not no, a bad day for it, it looks like. No, it does look like tomorrow's going to be nice. I mean, I, being my first regatta, I don't know, what, you know, what really changes. Uh, well, last year it was like wind. swelteringly hot, and right. like it was the. I remember the fire department actually had to start spraying water everywhere just so people yeah. could cool down. So it won't be one of those days. It won't be one of those days. Uh, certainly not. Temperatures, you know, going to be nice. I'd say if we take a look at the forecast for tomorrow, just quickly, there 19 degrees. It looks like should be the peak temperature. And then cloudy periods through the day across the board, really. Uh, and those winds will be variable. So pretty light, anywhere from 10 to as much as 15 kilometers per hour towards uh, the evening. They may bump up a little bit, but nothing more than that. Because uh, there's no real system in play that's going to uh, see strong winds with it. So these are temperatures across the board. A uh, good 20 to 25 degrees, it looks like. And again, those po uh, cloudy periods through the day. St. Anthony sitting at 18 degrees. Now up through Labrador tomorrow, it's unsettled. And we're going to see this pattern generally continue as we head through the next couple of days. Best chance of seeing some lightning will be around Churchill Falls, 20 degrees. Those winds generally variable. And then along the coast, easterlies 20 to 30 kilometers per hour. Temperatures not too bad, though, in the teens. Uh, finally, in the double digits for Nain, 10 degrees. And then Happy Valley Goose Bay looking at 19 through the day. So here's what uh, the future tracker is saying for tomorrow night into Thursday. Once uh, that system rolls out for Labrador. Another one is on your doorstep, but it does look like things should clear out through the afternoon uh, with some cloudy periods. And then a lovely day, it looks like, for Thursday as well for the island before the next system rolls in towards the weekend. But the thing that's keeping uh, these warmer temperatures, or bringing these warmer temperatures is a little bit of a ridge in the jet stream. And that's gonna move over us as we head through the next couple of days, certainly into Friday where we'll see the peak warmth from this and that's keeping things jet relatively calm. We do have some cooler air in behind it that will make its way through to Labrador. That's gonna cool those temperatures down, but generally through the weekend, it does look like we should see some lovely temperatures. So for your Thursday, Right now, looks like sunshine, 18 degrees for St. John's. Then we start to see that warmer air, uh, 26, 27 degrees. Could see that uh, jump up by another degree or two as we head towards Thursday. 23 degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Finally going to see some warmer temperatures. Cartwright as well, 22 degrees. And then uh, back up to about 13 for Nain. And then over the next five days, this is what we're looking at. So those teens will continue into Friday. You could see that chance of showers. And then Saturday, 25 degrees. But with that, again, unsettled with that potential for some showers. And then Sunday looking at 21 degrees and some cloudy periods through the day. Now for Central, 24 to 27 degrees. And then by Friday, that's when that rain will move in. And then the weekend as of now looking pretty lovely. Uh, again, with this as well, we're going to see some humidity move back in. So uh, these temperatures will feel much warmer than uh, what the ambient temperature is showing. 12 degrees, or rather 24 degrees for your Sunday. For Western Newfoundland, 25 tomorrow, 27 for Thursday. And then it becomes unsettled, but still with those warmer temperatures, warm, humid air mass with that potential for showers. And then up through Labrador, uh, Western or Eastern Labrador, rather 19 degrees tomorrow, 23 by Thursday, and then uh, generally gray to round out the weekend. And then we've got uh, similar for Western Labrador as well, 20 degrees and then uh, into the teens as that cooler air moves in for the rest of the weekend. So that's what the regatta forecast looks like in the next couple of days, but I'm gonna send it back to Jeremy where he is enjoying a absolutely beautiful evening out there by the water. Thanks, Ashley, and you're absolutely right. It is very sunny here. There are a few dark clouds earlier, but they've all sort of blown away, and it's a sunny day down here at the lake. And I've got to say, I've been talking to some of the food vendors down here, and they've been saying that this Regatta Day Eve is a lot busier than last year, and as we all know, last year was the big 200th anniversary. But there's a couple of, I'd say there's more than a 1,000 people down here munching away, a lot of families, a lot of kids taking in the festivities. And I know festivities is a big part of tonight because there's a very popular game that people play here called Regatta Roulette. And I know for a fact that my siblings are going to a Regatta Roulette party. And as people all know, you go, you party, 
hoping that Mother Nature and the weather will cooperate and that you'll get a day off tomorrow. Now for me, I've taken the day off, so I've already won the regatta roulette. But you may notice if you come down to the lake tomorrow, if you're successful and you win regatta roulette, that is, you'll notice that it's going to look a lot different. I'm down here by the boathouse, and as you can see, this is the brand new winner's circle. There's construction going on all spring and into the summer, working up until the last minute to get it ready for regatta day. And they finally did. And earlier today, they had the unveiling of all the new set up down here at the boathouse and I caught up with the president of the Royal St. John's Regatta Committee, Chris Neary, to tell me a little bit about it. I know we've talked about this before. What sort of upgrades did you do down here at the boathouse and around the lake in general? Yeah, so as you can see in our background here, you know, the winter circle is put in. It also includes some brickwork around here that uh, recognizes accomplishments of the championship teams and record record holders. And uh, also the parking here, people walking around the lake, for those who do it, a million people every year use Kitty Video Lake for a walking trail. And uh, the area around here where people were parking was as a hazard because people at part of the trail was actually going into the parking lot. So we've shifted all the parking down there. It's much more accessible for people, much more safer. And of course, the North Bank, much more accessible as well. People are coming down enjoying Regatta Day tomorrow. We'll be able to uh, walk on a flat plane the people operating the booths will have a flat surface to operate on and of course the uh, the, the dock across the way that's upgraded shaped like a boat for those people who come down to see it and is actually operational because it was getting close to its, its uh, end of life as well the old one how happy are you are you as the president of this committee to have this work finally done and in time for regatta yeah extremely happy you know uh, very close close deadlines very tight deadlines uh, the workers who were down here you know I was talking to them on a regular basis they were very proud of what they were doing on recognizing the history of what they were doing uh, really doubled their efforts to get it done on a deadline we're very happy for the hard work they put into it as well now we're a few hours until the official call is made for the running of the 201st regatta. Everything in place, everything ready to go from your standpoint? A few more things to get done, but nothing that uh, isn't uh, typical for uh, Regatta Eve. Uh, we'll get those completed. We'll uh, make sure everything's, uh, the boats are all ready, and uh, hopefully uh, weather permitting uh, tomorrow morning, we'll be making the call around 5.30 that the regatta will be going ahead and folks will have a holiday. Now I know that uh, the M5 team for women are not rowing this year and Outer Cove is looking a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So uh, from your point of view as a rower and the president of the club, <laughs> who will, should people be watching for tomorrow? Well, I, you know, I, I won't make any predictions <laughs> but uh, as president, but uh, and I certainly know most of the people in the boat, so I'll try to be neutral in my decision-making process. All I would do is say, you know, the fastest men's team is the found strokes team, and then the uh, fastest me women's team is the high hydraulics team. They both set the standard for time trials, and uh, we'll see what the other teams were. We are quite a number of teams are quite close so if people want to see some exciting races come down early in the morning and see those and of course the championship races are always exciting to watch as well so as you can see this is the back of the winner's circle it's the hall of fame and these are all the people who have been inducted into the hall of fame we were talking about that earlier this week and gary if we can pan down real quickly uh, onto the ground there so as you can see uh and this is where all the names. So there's tons of room, Mr. Neary said, so that they can add all the winners. So for many, many regattas to come. So hopefully the weather cooperates, everything goes according to plan, and that the races go ahead tomorrow morning when people wake up at 5.30 and make the call. Reporting live for here and now, I'm Jeremy Eaton at Kittivity Lake in St. John's. Well, I want to know where you're to. Look at this shot of these cute puffins. Aw, he's just, such a romantic puffin. I know, he's giving the other one a flower. How cute. <laughs> well, I'll let you know where this was too when we come back after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now, and one last shot. Jeremy down by the lakeside there. We already know you've won regatta roulette. You're not going to be in tomorrow, but uh, so I guess you can just hang out there all night. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just saying to our videographer, Gary, like, the crowds back here is something that you wouldn't even see last year, I think, until 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. So there are a lot of people down here tonight, maybe not playing regatta roulette, but they're taking in a bit of the sights and the sounds of regatta. And regatta eve, I guess, is apparently becoming a thing. Now, there's one interesting thing that I learned last year. Well, I didn't learn last year. I learned many years ago. There's one interesting thing about the regatta. It's, it's a moving holiday. We all know that. But it's one of the few holidays where it's not decided by an elected official. It's not decided, you know, Danny Breen can't call it, Dwight Ball can't call it, nobody can, not even Justin Trudeau himself could call this a holiday. This holiday in St. John's for Regatta Day is decided by the Royal St. John's Regatta Committee, and that's a decision that they'll wake up bright and early tomorrow morning and decide at around 5.30 a.m. So if you're wondering if the regatta is going to go ahead, you can tune in to CBC, the St. John's Morning Show on CBC Radio, and then that way they'll give you the update if the races are going ahead because they'll be in the water just after seven here. So you can tune into that. And then TV, Peter, I know that you'll be working. I don't think you'll be down at Regatta. Katie Breen will be stepping in for me, covering the stories down here. So we'll be live all night down from the lake. So tune into that. The radio, you can tune into TV. You can check us out on the web. There's lots of Regatta coverage. And we all know I loves the Regatta. Well, so enjoy Peter, the regatta, gonna... Jeremy. You won't have to <laughs> you, work Peter, it. You too. You en you enjoy the regatta too, Peter. I, know I, it's I will be down there John's chasing holidays. around a Mr. Justin <laughs> Trudeau. So uh, we'll have to see what he has to say tomorrow at the regatta. But uh, enjoy your day off and, uh, yeah, a whole lot more regatta fun to come. And there's lots to eat down here, Peter, so don't be shy. Well, and let's bring in Ashley now because uh, before the break, we were having a look at that really nice photo of those two cute little puffins. Two cute little puffins. Yeah, we'll take a look at that. There they are there. This photo was taken in Elliston. Of uh, course. Of course it was. Home of the Puffin Festival. Home of the Puffins. I was uh, actually up that way this weekend, so... Beautiful shot there. Thank you so much to Candice for sending that in. Beautiful shot. Parrots of the sea. That's what she called them. I thought that was so great. Yeah, with their cute little beaks there with the bright colors. Yeah, I saw them from the water. They were do adorable. <laughs> Just skimming across trying to That's fly right, away. That's right, trying yeah. to fly away. Too full of fish. That's right. If you have any pictures that you would like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca and we'll get them on the show for you. Well, thanks so much for watching. We've got a full day tomorrow. Lots of regatta coverage. We'll be uh, down there lakeside and uh, hope you can tune in. Good night.